Hello there ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Steel and Flesh 2. Now, are you a ruling monarch that has absolutely no idea what they're doing? Are you embarrassed to your subjects because you always mess up? Are you afraid that your citizens might rebel against you if they found out how incompetent you are as a ruler? Well ladies and gentlemen, you are in luck! Because in this video, I'm gonna be teaching you how to conduct an effective and successful dictatorship where your citizens will live in constant fear of their lives under the watchful 24-7 surveillance of a totalitarian police state. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna be teaching you how to properly rule and grow your empire in the world of Mountain Flesh 2. So, let us begin. Alright, so for this video, we're actually not gonna create a new character. I know, this is very strange, considering all of my Steel and Flesh videos involves creating a new character. But for this video, we don't need to do that. However, if you do want to start a new character and want a starting guide, then I suggest you check out the first game guide that I made on the channel. But for this video, we are gonna jump straight into a game. And we're in! Now ladies and gentlemen, I want you all to meet our legendary character for today's video, Isaac Tethes. Now, Isaac is rich and already is a king, as shown by the gold thing on top of his head. Now, you might ask me, how do you become a king in the game? Well, ladies and gentlemen, all you need to be king is to get a village or a castle under your control. Either you join and become king of a different faction, or get them through conquering and committing war crimes. Whichever do you prefer. Preferably the latter. As you can see here on the map, we have a number of castles and one village. It's a decent empire if I do say so myself. Now this here comes our first lesson. Lesson 1, Empire Size. The main reason for unwanted and unnecessary wars between factions is the size of their empires. As a ruler, you need to be mindful of how big your empire is getting. In order for you to properly monitor your empire, it is highly recommended that you get yourself an advisor. Go to the squad menu down here, then select advisor. If you don't have an advisor, you can easily hire one for just 5,000 gold. Now, an advisor is very useful. He can tell you a lot of helpful tips such as telling you which is currently the weakest state, some trading tips, and who is the best candidate to impose a tribute on. All of these are very helpful, but the best one he can help us on is telling us the status of our empire's foreign policy. This will help us determine the size of our empire. If our empire is small, he will tell us this. If our empire is medium-sized, he will tell us this. But if our empire is big, he will tell us this. I don't know where did the developer pull this idea out of, probably from his ass, but apparently, if you have a big empire, it threatens the integrity of other factions, which of course can lead to war. So now, the question here is, what is the threshold? How big can you make your empire before it is considered as threatening? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I actually ran tests on this and have found out that you can have a maximum of 14 possessions before your empire is considered threatening. 14 castles or villages is the threshold. If you have 15 or more, then your empire will be considered big and other factions can start declaring war on you. Now let's look at the map again. If you count my possessions, you'll find that I have 14 in total, 13 castles and 1 village. According to the advisor, we are currently conducting a moderate foreign policy, which is great. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want peace for your empire, keep your empire medium size. If it's too big, other factions will declare war on you in an attempt to make it smaller. When you're at war with a faction, you might think that doing a blitzkrieg on enemy castles and villages is the best strategy. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, you're wrong. So here comes lesson 2, war aggression. Rapidly going through and capturing village after village or castle after castle is a very bad idea, as this is seen as a very aggressive tactic. In order to properly monitor your war aggression, we are once again turning our attention to our dear friend, the advisor. Whenever we are at war, he will keep track of how much our empire has grown or lost from the war. If we capture a lot of possessions in a short amount of time, he will tell us that our empire has grown significantly and we are conducting an aggressive foreign policy. Aggressive foreign policy is again another common cause of unwanted or unnecessary wars. So when it comes to war, just capture castles or villages one at a time, or else you risk going to war with other factions. As a very responsible king with insecurities and paranoia such as yourself, you need to make sure that your castles are well defended. So here's lesson 3 to help you with that. Lesson 3, Empire Security A large presence of defensive troops posted in a castle is crucial for siege defense. It also prevents enemies from getting any ideas attacking the castle or a village. Depending on your command settings, castles and villages automatically generate, or more appropriately, higher troops over time. Additionally, you can transfer troops into a castle or a village by simply entering it, going into the squad menu, and transferring the amount of troops you want. Castles and villages has their own soldier limit. Villages has a limit of 20, castles has a limit of 100, and large castles has a limit of 300 troops. It's important to note that this limit only applies on automatic hiring of troops. This limit can still be bypassed by simply transferring troops into the castle or village. 100 defenders are enough to prevent most enemies from initiating a siege on your possessions. Now, let's take a look at our castles here. You'll see that most of our castles here have 100 troops in them. Even this village has 100 troops in it, and in our large castles, we have a whopping 500 troops. 500 here in Konya, 500 in Damascus, another 500 here in Sivas, and lastly, 500 here in Erzurum. So ladies and gentlemen, I think it's okay to say that our empire is relatively safe and secure. Now you might be thinking, why not just put 500 troops on every castle? Surely that's better, right? Well, if you think about it that way, yes, it is better. No one in the game would ever want to attack a castle with 500 defenders on it. However, doing that on every castle will cost you a lot of money. But that's not the main problem about it. Having 500 troops stationed in a castle is going to be a huge problem if ever this happens. Lesson 4. Rebellions As a king who literally torments his own citizens for entertainment, sooner or later your people are gonna rebel against you. And of course, that's not good. Rebellions happen randomly in the game. They can happen to anyone and honestly is the most annoying event to ever happen in the game. When rebellions happen in a castle, all troops posted in that castle will instantly turn against you. For example, if you have a castle with 500 troops on it, if by chance this castle rebels, all of the 500 troops including the lord of the castle will instantly become your enemies. And you already know it's a huge pain to siege back a castle with 500 defenders on it. So yeah, you cannot avoid rebellions nor stop them from happening. You can however mitigate your potential losses by lessening your defenders. So it's optimal to have only around 100 troops on each castle. It's not all that bad though, as there are exceptions for rebellions. Rebellions only happen on small castles. 
and they never happen on large castles and villages. So you can pretty much have as many troops as you want stationed on a village or in a large castle without the fear of them rebelling against you. With the rebellions taken care of, time to turn our attention towards the bigger picture. So here comes our final lesson for today's video. Lesson 5. Attack and Defense of course, as a king, you must also know how to effectively utilize and command your castle lords to strategically strike against your enemies and defend your own empire. And in order to do this, we first need to familiarize ourselves with the king's menu. Of course, this menu is only available if you're a king, and it can be easily found down here. In this menu, we have the Diplomacy tab. This is where we can declare war, make peace, impose tributes, and improve our relations with other factions. Now, what we want is the army tab here. This is where we'll be able to give attack and defend commands to our entire army. First, you need to specify the percentage of lords that will carry out the command. Second, select where you want them to attack or defend a specific castle. If you are at war with another faction, their castles will become available for you to select in the attack tab. Since we're not at war at the moment, there's currently nothing there. Now for the defend tab. If you want your army to go and defend your castle, just select which castle is under attack. For example, let's select Konya here and then finally, tap the defend button down here. If done correctly, we should be seeing our castle lords going to Konya to defend it. And yeah, here they are now. For these two buttons down here, these are the general commands. The meet here command will order your army to meet you on your position. And the attack command will order your lords to randomly do their own thing. They will automatically go and hunt down enemies or even conduct random sieges to the enemy castles. The command only works if you're at war though. And that's pretty much it about the king's menu. And so ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of this video. I hope you took these lessons to heart and may they serve you well in your own path to authoritarian dictatorship. Oh yes. So thank you for watching and see you guys in the next one.